So I wanted to start today with a bit of my thesis for today's talk. I know that we hear a lot of different messaging around the future of transportation, what it'll look like for transit agencies, and how that all relates down to uh, community safety. And I think the key points for me is that transit is changing. Every single day there's new opportunities, new modalities, new partnerships that we see. And so that landscape is ever evolving. And at the core of everybody's business for transit is that people need to be safe in and around those transit networks. And that's critical for the success of your agency and any partnerships that you may have. And then finally, third, we need to effectively communicate changes to all of those in and around transit. Because like the description for today's talk uh, noted, that if we don't have safety, we have nothing in terms of credibility, reliability, et cetera. So that's where really what um, were the core principles when I developed our presentation for today. A bit of an overview of our chat today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the future of transit. We'll go a little bit farther into the future and then we'll also talk about sort of the future that's already here on our doorsteps today. And then we'll look at some new approaches for communicating those safe futures. And then finally, how to impact the future. And that's where I'll show you a couple of different case studies and ideas that are already happening in cities and agencies around the country and across the globe. So diving into the future of transit. So if you're a member of the Canadian Urban Transit Association, um, it's probably a pretty good assumption uh, that you've got the Transit Vision 2040 document printed out and maybe on your bedside for reading. Uh, but all kidding aside that this document is really a helpful look into the future. So if we're just looking 20 short years, we start to see a shift in the way that transit operates. And I love that the, the document that CUTA put out for this because it really starts to demonstrate the cultural shift that we're seeing around transportation and how the public is really starting to demand more from transit agencies. Also, we're going to see as our population continues to grow and we certainly have uh, demographic shifts in some of the different age categories, we're going to see ridership increasing and changing in terms of what they require in terms of accessibility and security. And the thing is, is when I read this document, many of these changes aren't surprising. They kind of follow the trends that we're seeing as a population. And it also goes to speak to some of the changes that we're already seeing today. Like, for example, multimodal transit options being introduced. We still, or excuse me, we've already got those happening in many different municipalities across the country. And I think we'll only start to see them diversify in terms of options and partnerships. Transit, I think really this document underscores the fact that transit is no longer an afterthought, but something that we really need to consider uh, for and when we're looking at collaboration and opportunities for partnership projects. So that's sort of where we're going in CUTA's forecast for the future. And if we dive into the document, and it is available on CUTA's website, but one thing I wanted to point out from within the document is actually looking at that enhancement of safety and security. That's really where Salt and Company focuses and where everybody should be turning in their attention. And where you see this yellow uh, bubble around um, this line item is the fact that this is a, a shared responsibility across many different agencies. So it's not only the transit system, but really starts to get into a number of other critical areas as well. So this is not something just for your agency or just for your marketing team or just within a certain committee. This is really um, a strategic response to a demand that we will need for that safety and security moving forward. Um, so this doctor, sorry, this picture um, is actually taken, borrowed from the City of Toronto's King Street pilot project. And this is sort of their before image, before they revolutionized one of our main arteries throughout the city. But I love it because it's a great bird's eye view of transit and all of the opportunities. So the thing here is when we're looking at this street, we've got a lot of different players, whether it's a streetcar, trucks, cyclists, taxis, ride shares, pedestrians. And I think that we need to look at our transit as this. Boundaries are certainly expanding and it's no longer people who are in your system or on your vehicles anymore that we need to consider. The transit boundaries have expanded to include everything in this picture because people are now using transit in different ways. And when we look at something like first mile, last mile, which I'll talk about in a moment, we're starting to see people transition or transfer between different vehicles, different modalities, different stations. And within them, this starts to weaken our safety metrics. 
And we need to start to look at ways that we can create a continuum of compliance when it comes to safety across the entire transit ecosystem as it exists today, but also prepare for what it may look like tomorrow as transit riders needs get increasingly more complex. So first mile, last mile, like I mentioned, um, it's not a new concept, but I wanted to touch on it because when we look about look at transit for the future as well as transit today, it's a really important one. And it's something that we've seen informally. Certainly people need to get to, for example, uh, a train station and then get from their train station to the final destination. But we're starting to see more formal partnerships that are evolving into more standardized transit options. And this, quite frankly, it just speaks to the fact that door-to-door -door service is not a concept that can be supported by a high volume public transit. So linking those travel options in a more formal capacity through strategic partnerships gives those riders a lot more flexibility and in service, increasing the accessibility level, which again, when we're looking at 2040 with that CUDA document is a really important consideration. But the thing that I wanted to draw attention to when we look at first mile, last mile options is that when we start to look at the safety elements, we see a system that becomes increasingly more complex with those transfers and those interchanges, and those represent a lot of vulnerability opportunities. So how do we start to have conversations with perhaps the cycle commuters to ensure that they're safe on their journey and within the transit system? And also whose responsibility is it to make sure that those cyclists are being safe on the way to your station? How can we start to look at minimizing risk, for example, when a rider leaves the train and makes their way to a rideshare pickup point? Is that rideshare pickup point on your property or off your property? And how do we speak to the concerns of all of those very different groups and make something that's seamless for them in terms of experience, but also very safe across the entire experience? I wanted to also point out that we are seeing car disruptions. And so, you know, there's a lot of different actors when, it look, when we look at transit and that whole entire ecosystem. And the thing is, is all of these different actors are really vying for a piece of the pie to disrupt. And we've seen that with a lot of different organizations already. And I will note that this, uh, this image does come from US partners. So some of those statistics, they are US based, but I really think that it's a strong representation of all of the alternatives that we're starting to see to car ownership, which could be a great thing for all of my transit agency folks on the line. And I think that if you look at this image and notice that these players aren't in your jurisdiction already, you really need to prepare for them or one of their competitors to roll in and potentially ask for a space in that already cluttered market. And when it comes to this sort of car disruption and new opportunities for transportation, I know that there can be a lot of trepidation for some of these different groups. And we've seen that play out in jurisdictions across the country and around the world. And we've seen how a lot of municipalities and agencies are left sort of scratching their heads how to integrate these new regulations and networks and partnerships for some of these disruptive transportation industries to come in. So this is where when we're looking at transit today, we're seeing this huge rise. But when we look at the transit for tomorrow, that's where I really urge you to be proactive. And how can you shift your thinking to proactivity? How can you start to look at these new opportunities instead of as challenges? And then I'd question you to say, how can you really form new meaningful relationships with transportation alternatives and integrate them into your larger agency or network so that you can provide better service at the end of the day? And then once you've kind of harnessed the opportunity, it's all about how you can extend and expand safety measures to ensure and reconcile the fact that the riders are now operating in a more complex system. How can you create an innovation department even so that your organization can ask these sorts of questions and come up with answers before you need to? So again, when we're looking at some of these disruptive groups, I wanted to point out that, again, this is not something that's happening down the road, no pun intended, uh, but something that's actually happening today. So the image on the left hand um, side of your screen is actually some a relationship that grew between Uber and the municipality of Innisville here in Ontario. And they actually partnered with Uber to 
offer a ride share transit model that was actually subsidized for their citizens. And so ride sharing was actually brought in as an alternative to public transportation. And the municipality worked quite closely with Uber to ensure that it was still very affordable in line with transit expectations around um, fee for service. On the right hand side of your screen, that's an example of a partnership that's developed between Lyft, another ride sharing group, and the Go services or Metrolinx um, here in Toronto in the GTA. And they really partnered on the first mile, last mile idea. So again, recognizing that their trains may drop off in stations that aren't necessarily right next door to their riders' homes, Lyft is now this opportunity to deliver people to their front door minimizing the need for their own personal vehicle or providing more opportunity and options for their different riderships. So again, if we're underscoring everything with a look towards safety, how does it translate across your partnerships, especially amongst organizations that are really defining and redefining their safety expectations and regulations on an evolving basis? Another thing that I wanted to talk about was how our vehicle systems are changing too. So here we've got a couple of different examples of electric buses. Um, so we've seen them roll out in, no pun intended again, um, Winnipeg as well as St. Albert, Alberta. And we've got them in a number of jurisdictions across the country as well. And the thing is, is we're also seeing these fleets start to change and modernize within a larger efficiency and environmental context. And those are incredible new advances and represent tremendous amount of opportunity for industry, for transit networks and municipalities and the earth, quite frankly, as well. But a bit of a conundrum when it comes to electric vehicles is that the majority of them are silent or are a lot less loud than their sort of older counterparts. So again, I ask a few questions. Is how do you ensure that you communicate all of these advances to your ridership and the existing community? Because remember, your community has grown and evolved and it's no longer the people that ride on the bus, but it's everybody around the bus, whether it's a driver, a pedestrian, a cyclist. How do you ensure that they are well aware of how you've changed your system and how can they be aware to keep themselves safe? So auditory elements, these are lost and how do you, start to bring those back in because those are normally very critical things for safety. Now when we look at transit today, there's also technology today and I wanted to fold this into our presentation as well because there's a lot of different players on the scene when it comes to new applications and technology uh, adoptions for keeping people safe on the road. So again, this is coming from the perspective of how do you start to embrace technology and integrate it into your business already? So one of the uh, really interesting tech pieces that's come out in the last year is this idea of app-based driver coaching. And this is done by a Toronto-based company called Onlia. And it's interesting because now you can start to look at technology as a way to improve potentially your fleet by coaching drivers throughout their trip based on their mobile application scores that come through this app. Or is this an opportunity to use an app like this to create a training mandated across your first mile, last mile partners to ensure that everybody is really singing from the same songbook when it comes to safety initiatives and also a certain standard of driving. Another technology that I thought was worth mentioning is around the whole connected and autonomous vehicle space. So how do you start to mitigate the risk that's coming out of connected and autonomous vehicles? So we know that these can be great for efficiencies, getting people around, connected infrastructure and vehicles can really lend itself to efficiencies across the board. But how do you start to ensure that everybody within your transportation network, and remember that's not just the transit network, can have their play or you know, maintain their safety when it comes to these sorts of new technologies. So in the example of an autonomous vehicle, how can your pedestrians in your municipality or your cyclists know that an autonomous vehicle will see them and stop in time? And we've seen that this industry is heavily evolving with each and every single day. But what if there was a vehicle to pedestrian low latency opportunity that would actually connect those vehicles to the pedestrians and create a two-way dialogue around safety? Again, an interesting piece that we can start to expand on when we look for our future solutions. And then finally, one that probably isn't a surprise to many of you, but certainly 
Uber's integrated uh, technology for transit systems. So they've actually taken many transit agencies' networks and included it in their app. And so they're reducing the friction when it comes to payment and also creating a central hub for all sorts of different transit options. And so this, again, offers another opportunity. How do you work with these different groups, but also make sure that the same sort of safety and the expectation for compliance amongst users follow suit throughout these different apps where now your transit information is migrated to. So that was a quick look at the future, um, but also I know it was very much a look at today and some of the things that we're seeing already changing the landscape of technology, of safety, and how we need to start to look critically at those different gaps and really start to manage them appropriately. Now I really want to focus on how we start to communicate it. And the first thing that I wanted to start is start with rather is a little bit of public health. So as you know, I came from that world of public health and where we typically look at impactful interventions for large scale populations. And I know that the information on the screen here is not news for anybody, uh, but the World Health Organization continually comes out and does uh, a global report on road safety. And in their latest report available, which is a 2018, um, they have come to the conclusion that we've got about 1.35 million transportation related fatalities around the world every single year. And the important thing here, and I've got the map up on the screen because this isn't a new problem and this isn't an isolated problem for any one region. But the thing here is that the report continually comes back to the fact that this is a population level problem and it requires new solutions. And so we need to start looking outside of our traditional transit toolbox and start to look at some new ways to communicate safety throughout those communities across and within your networks. So that's really where I wanted to focus today, was on this sort of public health approach and creating culture change. So the very uh, colorful um, graphic that you see there on the screen is actually called the Spectrum of Prevention. And it was developed by the Prevention Institute. And again, this is a, a public health tool or an injury prevention tool that we typically see. And when it comes to road safety and specifically transit, time and time again the behaviors good and bad but we really need to start to create a culture change around safety and injury prevention especially when we see this forecasted growth up until 2040 around key transportation um, modalities and opportunities so culture change it doesn't happen overnight I'm sorry to say um, but the thing is is the average citizen they typically aren't going to decide that today is the day that they're going to change how they act in the world. Um, it's actually a longer, slower process. And that's where you start to see shifts in behavior. But most typically, or rather most importantly, it's a coordinated effort. So you can see there on your screen, we've got things like influencing policy and legislation, changing organizational practices. So that could be something that ties directly into your day to day fostering coalitions and networks, again, critically important for you to start thinking beyond your agency walls and beyond your stations and really collaborating much like you are in associations like this. Educating providers, especially when we're starting to see new transit providers on the scene, like some of those disruptive networks that I was talking about. Bringing it back into the community and really promoting that education. And then finally, the most important, but over time is strengthening individual knowledge and their skills. So it's this sort of coordinated approach that really starts to bleed into those culture shifts around behavior. And then really looking at that public health approach. And again, another colorful model, um, but really this is an evidence-informed model around public health. And I show you this not to confuse you or add many more layers into what's probably already a very busy agenda in your world but it's really to show you the intentionality that's required when we start to look at uh, changing behavior, whether it's transit related or another typical public health type behavior. And this sort of, sort of multi-level step, it goes along with the Prevention Institute's breakdown as well, but it really is an iterative approach, or iterative approach rather, um, that starts with that community assessment. So it's really coming back to what are the needs and what's happening, and then ensuring that it's a research-backed, data-driven approach that you keep coming back to and refining time over time. 
And it's these sorts of things that will help you to start cultivating those conversations around safety in your communities and engage your different riders and create solutions that actually work very well for them. So now that I've kind of given you a couple glimpses into frameworks, and you know, I could talk about this all day, but I won't. Um, I wanted to touch base on a couple of case studies that I thought were really important. Um, I've worked in my career a lot on Vision Zero, and if you're not familiar with that, it's a Swedish road safety framework uh, that basically posits that no one should be seriously injured or killed on our roadways. And it's a bit of an ethical conversation around how we set our targets and what we do in terms of road safety and prevention, but it also demonstrates a large shift from um, an individual responsibility to a systems-based engineering solution that really supports drivers and other road users, even if they fail or make a bad mistake. It says that the roadway should support them so that we avoid those serious injuries and fatalities. We've certainly seen that spread across many different jurisdictions in Canada. And it's something that I think is interesting because it's a new way of looking at things and it borrows a lot from the public health approach. So while I'm not saying that Vision Zero is necessarily the best fit for transit, I think that what we've learned from some of our North American counterparts can actually help us to start think about, thinking rather about how we can implement some public health ideas into our safety communication for communities. So really when we start to look at San Francisco's experience throughout um, one of these public health models, they were really looking when they adopted Vision Zero for a way to reconfigure their transportation safety framework. So like I mentioned, Vision Zero is all about preventing those serious injuries and fatalities with that eventual goal of zero, but it's a pretty big concept and something that is, takes a long time and really requires a coordinated approach. So this uh, case study, and I can always share it with you, comes from the Vision Zero network out of San Francisco. Um, but really their Vision Zero team, they use the public health framework to change behavior. This model, it moves through five stages, as you can see, and it walks individuals through the various stages of readiness for change. And San Francisco, they did a lot of really deep learning. They dove into the data. They did a lot of community consultation to understand the issues at play when it came to road safety and what was impacting their citizens and keeping them from being safe. And from that, they really understood what target audiences to reach and where those target audiences were represented in this, this framework. And this is an interesting one because it really, this public health framework, it says that people are always at different stages of readiness for change. And I'm sure that you've heard that in different ways before. But it allows you to design messaging that will actually hit those key target markets in a way that speaks directly to them. So when we look through the San Francisco model, you know, they looked at potentially where people pre-contemplative, so they could recognize that road safety was an issue, but maybe they weren't sure what to do yet. Were they contemplative of the idea they could choose a new way to drive or cycle or just get around their city? Were they preparing for, you know, a new way by identifying what actions they could take? Had there been an action that was now sustainable and imprinted on their mind? Were they actually really kind of ready to do this and maintain it for the long run and have a tangible behavior change. So by going through the different stages of readiness, San Francisco, it's really interesting, was able to have a really unique and impact conversations with citizens around with their safety and sort of how they traveled around the city. And throughout it all, the most important part is that San Francisco really kept on top of their evaluations. So they really wanted to know when and how people progressed through the different stages of readiness. And that allowed them to come back and measure the effectiveness of their interventions and their messaging so that they could also kind of understand what they could continue doing and what maybe they should stop and, and rework in terms of the overall intervention. So not only is it effective, but also efficient because it allows for um, opportunities to catch issues or potentially non-resonating messages before they kind of um, invest all of their resourcing into them. Another example that I wanted to share from the Vision Zero Network's case study is New York. And I wanted to compare and contrast this a little bit because while San Francisco looked at the five stages of readiness um, 
as they were kind of occurring in situ with their population, New York City actually did a bit of a different approach where they actually look more at a calendar year and organize their intervention around it. And this is really helpful because then if you're working across different partnerships, a calendar can really be supportive of ensuring everybody is working with the same resourcing and messaging throughout the entire intervention. So like I mentioned, they coordinated their, or their messaging approach with different stages of readiness, but a little bit different than San Francisco. And they did this after a deep dive into their data around what target demographic to reach first. Because of course they needed to do a needs assessment and understand where the greatest issues were and where they could make the largest impact, especially when the Vision Zero framework was still evolving within the city. And through their research, they found that the biggest um, primary group for them in terms of an intervention were male drivers, adult male drivers. And this was a key consideration for them. And it allowed them to build out all of their messaging around a very specific demographic and really be able to, again, speak to them in their language. So all of the formative research built out their sort of business case. And then from there, they selected their critical topic areas and develop different stages of communication, as you can see here. So awareness of the issue. First of all, we need to create that buy-in for your target audience. And then it's developing familiarity with the hard data to create a priority issue in your target audience's mind. So why should they care about this? Why does it impact them? And then consideration for new approaches to change behavior. So very similar to what we saw in San Francisco, you need to really uh, plant the seed in people's minds so that they start to think of behavior change as a new idea and something that's accessible. And then finally, those action phases to really ensure that you're targeting specific behavior modification and creating sustainable behavior modification. Because if it only works once and then they forget, you're not going to have that huge shift in safety and culture. So that's a little bit about kind of the public health approach and where I'd really implore you to invest some time in thinking about how it can impact the way that you have conversations around safety within your agency. It's a really, it's a new way of thinking, which again, it speaks to that idea that these transportation issues are not going away and we're seeing advancement in a lot of different areas, whether it's technology, whether it's municipalities and how they do things, but it's really important to come back and say that or look rather at the approaches that are required to really create an impact. So like I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our presentation today, I've got a couple of um, different examples here to talk through to give you an idea of how some of these frameworks and ideas play out in the real world. So in public health, it's not enough to merely identify a problem and just come up with a solution. Because typically when, we come, when it comes to injury prevention and road safety or transportation or transit safety, it's not a one size fits all sort of scenario. So one of the simplest ways that I like to distill down all of these different public health frameworks and ideas is to look at the problem as well as the solution, but we need to distill it even further. So to be effective, you really need to define the problem and understand your audience in such a way that you can define that problem as it relates to someone. So it's not enough to say that there's an issue, that issue has to be important to somebody. For example, if we look at a typical public health uh, messaging around smoking, for example, smoking is bad, that could be a problem. Um, but a teenager that's angling to get into university on maybe a track and field scholarship, well, now you can create a problem that specifically relates to them and talk about how smoking could really reduce their athletic performance and keep them from getting the scholarship of their dreams. So you see how you're starting to create not only the problem, but making sure that it resonates with your target audience. So again, it's important to know that target audience inside and out. And then it's about defining a solution. So if we look at our example of our university track star, hopeful, um, it's not enough to just say stop smoking, but really provide them with the tools to be able to stop smoking on their own. Maybe, you know, they're an athlete and they're still living under mom and dad's roof. You need to provide an alternative to smoking, or sorry, to stopping smoking that wouldn't necessarily mean they have to tell their parents. Or maybe it is giving them tools about how to talk to your parents. Uh, maybe it's providing information around alternatives and especially knowing public health, um, alternatives that are safe and supportive 
for them to actually accomplish their dreams and their goals. So again, coming back to that defining a solution, but it has to be something that somebody can personally understand, relate to, perform, or attain. If you look at transportation, if you're uh, working with somebody around a transit agency and maybe um, you know trying to ensure that they are always uh, on time for a train and never running down a train platform because that can be kind of dangerous. It doesn't help if they always get out of work just before the moment they're meant to get on the train and they're always running late. You need to start to come up with different messaging that would impact their way in such a way that they can now start to understand the path to the solution and not just dismiss it because it won't work for them. The example here on the screen is from, again, New York City. And I love this one because it's messaging that they developed around Vision Zero. And they recognize the importance of having a multilingual approach for this, this messaging. And we'll, you'll see it in English as well, if you can't read what's on the screen uh, there in the middle, but uh, we'll also talk about it in the next slide. But again, this is really understanding not only what the issue is, but also how to make it be impactful. Further, uh, it's that idea of customizing and catering your messaging. So I love this approach and New York City has actually done a great job with external marketing agencies to really bolster their Vision Zero uh, road safety approach. And one of the things here, if you can't read it, it says he was racing, the driver was, and 85% of all traffic related pedestrian deaths in the Bronx involved dangerous driver choices. And I highlight that because they actually took their data related to specific neighborhoods. And then all of a sudden you've got a hyper-local geo-specific message that really conveys the importance of, um, in this case, road safety to your intended audience. And now you're also hitting a lot closer to home because while New York is a massive city, I know the Bronx is still quite large in and of itself, but now you're starting to talk in sort of closer context to where people live, work and play. So again, understanding exactly what's happening at a very granular level can help you customize and cater that messaging so that you have a better impact and a better chance for behavior change. Another tactic that I love, um, and this is, I think it's out of the Portland Transit Agency, is bringing stakeholders on board. So these poster campaigns, they were put out, I think around Halloween, it kind of fits with the theme of monsters and witches. And this one is actually really interesting because they worked with the local school system to not only just develop the posters, but also to distribute them. And it was actually a free resource that was made available to teachers across the city. And it really allowed them to start to bring messaging into schools and go home with children, but also allowed the transit agency to extend their reach through partnership. And so this one, it's great because again, it's very specific to a certain age group they understand and uh, who they're trying to reach and creating sort of a bit of fun and whimsy around it. And I, one of the things that I love about this is that uh, two of the three, so the first um, two, I'm just looking at my screen here, uh, the first two, so the Hydra and the Gargantuan, this also represents um, some really positive messaging when it looks, when it's telling riders, especially young children, what they should do. So knowing to wait behind the bumpy line or only use marked crossing areas. And when we look at behavior change and especially when it comes to injury prevention and transit safety, it's always really effective to provide people with indication or direction around what they should do. Because typically when we tell people what they shouldn't do, they kind of typically they can deny that they're ever gonna that's gonna happen to them. It's a bit of an othering um, factor where people may think, well, you know, you're telling me what not to do. I could do it. It's fine. Um, but instead, we love to give people tools about how they can be safer. So Skylar, the sorceress, it says to never get in front of the big heavy max train. They could have changed the messaging, but I think it still works in terms of the context of who they're talking to and the conversations that will come out when educators are using these resources. But I just wanted to highlight that one little piece there because even when it comes down to your messaging, it can be critical to get it right. And there's certain things you may never even think of. And then one of the last ones that I've got for you here today is around surprise and delight. Um, and this one, I'm, I'm happy to send the link to anybody. There's a more detailed story about it as well as a video that goes alongside of it. 
Um, but this is a really interesting road safety campaign that came out of Sweden. And basically, um, I believe it was right downtown in Stockholm, and they had an issue with people speeding, which, you know, is a global issue. And one of the, what they looked at doing was coming up with a new way to um, have a conversation with people about speeding. And they put it out as sort of a community competition to facilitate the idea process. And somebody came up with this whole idea for the Swedish speed lotto. So as you can see there um, on the screen, you've got your typical driver feedback sign that shows the speed limit, or sorry, the speed that a car is going. And the idea was is that if you were driving the speed limit, you got a green light up sign with the, the kilometers per hour and a thumbs up, as you can see there. However, if you were driving over the speed limit, it was red and you got a thumbs down. And that's not where it ended, however. They actually had um, photo radar as well, and they were able to see who was speeding and who was driving the speed limit. And the whole idea is if you were driving the speed limit, so you were complying, you were entered into a lottery. You could win some money for doing the right thing. And then if you were speeding, you got that red thumbs down, you actually, your license plate was tracked and you were sent a ticket. And the thing about the lottery is that it was totally funded by all the people who were speeding. <laughs> and so I just think that this is an incredible opportunity to look at a new way to sort of gamify or fun theory um, around a known behavior that sort of up until that point, there was not really a new solution for. And so this is something that, again, it's that change of behavior, it's catching people off guard, and it's introducing a new way of thinking to an age-old problem. So as I start to kind of get to the end of my presentation here, I think some of the key messages that I really wanted to share, and of course these are in the handout for the presentation today, is that it's important to connect with the people who are in your system, but also around your system, and recognizing that your system is expanding and will only continue to do that. It's important to come up with sticky ideas that will really help people, um, help in shepherding them through the whole problem solving scenario. And know that safety inherently is not a sexy kind of thing that people love to think about all day long. So if you can come up with interesting ways to catch them in a new frame of mind or surprise and delight, or come up with a deeper sort of resonating philosophy as to why they should be safe in your transit agency, that can be critical. Uh, like I mentioned with all those public health uh, behavior change models, it's really critical to go through them intentionally and make sure that you're not skipping the steps because that's where the missed connections can happen and understanding the data and the community and as well what's working or what not, what's not working can really help you be more successful. And then finally, coming back to, again, that whole idea of problem and solution. It can't just be directive. You need to have actions that people can identify with and are reasonable for them to implement in their own world. And if I had to give one piece of advice, it would be to not wait for the future because the future actually was yesterday. You can wait until 2020 if you're taking some end of year holidays, but let's start chatting in 2020 about how you're gonna identify those gaps, understand the issues that are at play, not only in your own transit community, but in the transportation world in general. Um, take time to develop that approach and test engagement, but also engage stakeholders in a meaningful way so you have all of those perspectives before you hit go. And then finally, the thing that underscores all of this is invest in prevention. Public health, where again, that's where I got my roots, it's all about prevention because prevention is always cheaper than the cure. And like I said off the top, you never know if you've done a good job because nothing will happen when it comes to prevention, but that's the best feeling at the end of the day. For more resources uh, for today's talk, uh, I invite you to visit saltandcompany.co.